Hello, I'm Craig and welcome to another episode of Football Kit Memories, the football podcast that gets it under the shirt. In today's episode, I'm joined by author, football historian and former director of the English National Football Museum, Dr Kevin Moore. During our chat, Kevin shares his memories about the conception and opening of the museum, which he ran for his first 20 years. There's the history, the artefacts and a number of stories Kevin shares about his life in football. Later, I asked Kevin to pick out three of his favourite football shirts and tell me a little bit about what they mean to him. Each of these shirts either is or has at one point been on display at the museum itself, as we cover Maradona's Hand of God Away shirt from 1986, the English shirt Bobby Moore saw with Pele in 1970, and we finish in 1872 with what is comfortably the oldest shirt we've had on the podcast so far, it's the Woolen Jersey England War, the first ever international match versus Scotland. Remember, you can listen to this and other episodes of Football Kit Memories on all major audio platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please do like, follow, share, but above all, please do enjoy the podcast. Okay, so today on the podcast, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by author, football historian and former director of the National Football Museum, Dr. Kevin Moore. How are you, Kevin? I'm very well, thank you, Craig. Very good indeed. But it's, it's, it's so good to have you here. There's there's plenty to talk about. Um, I wanted to kind of roll it back. So originally, your your your, your job was a university lecturer, right? Yeah, in history and then museum studies, though I had worked in museums as well. But I really wanted to go into public history um, rather than being an academic for life. I wanted to create museums and exhibitions about things that people were really interested a mass audience and I got the I saw the opportunity to uh, be the founding director of the National Football Museum first in Preston and then in Manchester where it got half a million visitors a year so a real success and uh, I led it for 20 years um, and delighted we got the world's best collection of football memorabilia some amazing artifacts to two shirts uh, two of the shirts are in, in what, what three all three at one time one's on loan okay. these three shirts i've chosen were on display sadly only two of them are now at the museum right uh, and so but yeah an astonishing collection and the you know the importance of football football is important enough a part of our culture who, who would not think that but 20 or 20 years ago people didn't um, uh, you, the US had a soccer hall of fame and a museum before we did. I mean, this is just wow. crazy. Um, so, uh, but then they have sports museums on everything. So exactly. There's a different attitude. There. There's a hall of fame for everything in the USA. But it was long overdue. And nobody now questions that there should be a National Football Museum for England. And of course, there's one for Scotland, which opened at, before the English one, slightly in 2001. There's one now in Northern Ireland, and I'm delighted. I've done a bit of work as a consultant to advise on the development of the Welsh National Football Museum in Wrexham. Fantastic news. Great. So how did you, so you actually saw the job advertised, did you? Is that how you first found out about it? Yes. No, no, I did know about it because I'd seen there was a project there. I, I, yeah. I, I, when I was at Museum Studies at Leicester, I put a student on placement um, to, to work there and he said there might be a job coming up I'll let you know uh, they might be looking for a director they're going for lottery funding so um, that didn't, didn't give me a way in it just meant I was aware of it so uh, right. and we did get 9.3 million to set up the National Football Museum in Preston but we always wanted to get a bigger audience at a bigger site as well because no disrespect to Preston it's 100,000 people we got 100,000 visitors a year that's really good yeah uh, but we we were always struggling a bit there financially. Um, we were we started talking to Wembley in in 1998 before we opened in Preston about a branch at Wembley, and they were really keen. This is 98 yeah. before the old Wembley was demolished. Um, uh, when I left the National Folk Museum 20 years later, we were still talking to Wembley about <laughs> a Wembley museum which wouldn't just be football but be about the olympics and live aid and everything i mean so many other things have happened at wembley as well yeah, right um rugby league etc etc um but uh yeah so but what happened was we got the opportunity to to go to manchester for another site yeah and unfortunately there wasn't funding to keep the preston site going as well um so 
a completely new version of the National Folk Museum. So I opened in Preston in 2001. We would have liked to keep both. There wasn't the funding. The new version opened in Manchester in 2012. More than twice the space, uh, you know, so it was much bigger. It, it really did it more justice than we've been able to do it in Preston. Right. So originally it was lottery funding and now, I mean, it's nothing to do with the government or the FA, right? It's a no, no, we we got £100,000 a year from the government when we were in Preston. It was a right. tiny amount of money. For, and we were the only sports museum to get anything. I mean, to be honest, part of the reason why we ended up going to Manchester rather than staying, well, the collection's still in Preston. The world's greatest collection of football memorabilia, including the FIFA collection, is still in Preston. Researchers come from all over the world to go to Preston to see, to see the archive and collection there. Yeah. There is no public display there anymore. But part of the reason we moved is we just didn't get enough financial support from football um, right. or, or government. Um, it just wasn't sustainable. The football bodies pulled their funding. Um what we got from the football bodies it's great but it's in the wrong place you know it, it's not going to maximize its audience we said we're there for reasons of history yeah and also we've done lots of exhibitions around the country and overseas and we're looking at Wembley we, we'd like a second site mm. and and the, then it looked like we were going to go to London uh, the FA was serious under Lord Treesman about moving it we said look keep it open in Preston and open but he wanted to move it to 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 Wembley yeah. but then with Wembley Stadium uh, you know the financial difficulties when it, it it's still not happened let's put it this way we're, they're still talking about it uh, we got on with it Manchester made us a fantastic offer yeah um, actually it was part or largely European funded in Manchester um, through the European Regional Development Fund. Manchester City Council said, look, we've got this Urbis building. We will close that as Urbis, uh, as a cultural centre. It will become the National Folk Museum. We'll put up half the 8 million with 4 million coming from the ERDF, European Regional Development Fund. And we'll put the revenue funding in each year as well. So it was it was a brilliant offer. Um, and so the museum's been highly successful in, in Manchester. Yeah. So how do you go about, you know, initially, like how did you go about getting all the kind of collections? You mentioned the FIFA collection that was acquired by the museum. Yeah. yeah. So we, we collected from, I mean, ordinary members of the public would ring up all the time and offer material. Um, yeah. Once thing, particularly after we opened in 2001, but even before that, because they would say, look, this is my granddad's FA Cup winner's medal. And I'd say, well, it's worth money. We have, we, we're not allowed to give valuations, but we would suggest that you do because, you know, right. this is a family heirloom. It has financial value. And they'd go, I know that, but I don't want a rich collector to own it and stick it in a bank. Yeah. I, I know if you take it as a museum. You can never sell it. It will be there forever. Museums right. can't ever dispose of their collections. So, um, but the foundation of the museum, thanks to funding from the Lottery Fund, what the Lottery, uh, what was then the Heritage Lottery Fund, now National Memorial, Her National Lottery Heritage Fund, got it right, sorry, oh. National Lottery Heritage Fund now, was as a permanent home for the FIFA collection. Um, now, the FIFA collection sounds like it's, it's about FIFA, it's not. Um, one Englishman, Harry Langton, a, a sports collector, dealer and journalist on the Daily Express, very well known in the 60s on the Daily Express, put together the world's greatest collection of football memorabilia, almost by accident. <laughs> uh, well, the, the truth is he could sell his rugby and tennis material, but he couldn't sell the football material. Really? Um, yeah, he couldn't sell it. There was no market in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but also... Harry, when I pressed him on this, he went, well, I'm more fond of football, so I kind of couldn't let the football no, go. Okay. There was an element of that. So he built up this amazing collection, and um, that was – FIFA bought it from him. He took it himself to the World Cup in Italy in 1990 and then the USA in 94. FIFA saw it, bought it, wow. knew that it was too important to lose this collection for it to be broken up, sold off. Um and uh, FIFA then decided we should be the right permanent home. So sold the collection at a very reasonable rate to the National Football Museum. They decided 
England was the home of football anyway. The collection's mostly about English football, but there is some international material as well. And yeah. it still has the name FIFA collection on it. And that was the foundation. But then the FA opened its doors and the all the football bodies, the football league when it left Lytham St. Anne's and the collections have just grown and grown. It's it's over a hundred thousand items now. Right. So in terms of you know, be, you mentioned being a bit of a trailblazer. So the first kind of the home nation's first kind of national museum for England. Was that a trailblazer in terms of like world football too as well then? So stuff in America, but... Well, like... fa fairness to the Scots, they were planning their own, uh, the Scottish Football Association totally behind it. Unlike the one in England where the, the football bodies sort of were on the ring. Around. FIFA were always really supportive and UEFA, but of course they can't single out the National Football Museum for England. The You know, one of the richest leagues. And the, in fairness, the Scots were... The Scottish Football Association decided to go for a museum at Hampden Park, and that actually opened, I think, the, the month before we did. So oh, we wow. have to give credit to the Scots as the actual trail, though though there was, depends what you mean, there's private museums of material in other countries. Are they national football museums, as we really should understand them? No. The American one closed. Um, uh, it's reopened in... And bizarrely, somewhere, it, well, not why is it the wrong place? It's somewhere in Texas now. It okay. was in New Zealand and in New England, but it's it's in a smaller size. But yes, when we were in in Preston, we had so many delegates coming saying we're going to set up a national football museum. Once they knew how much money was it, you know, it's easy to say. It's very difficult to do. It took the Germans nearly a decade after the World Cup in 2006 to open, actually open their National Football Museum in Dortmund. You know, they got there in the end, but this isn't easy. Um, it's, it's setting up so okay, it's the long-term funding that right. that's the issue. So there are some, but there aren't as many as you'd think. Um, and some don't test, uh, you know, some even come and go, you know, they, they aren't there where they were, like the one in Uruguay. So. I see. Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. Tough gig. So I was going to ask you, you know, you picked out three amazing shirts that we're going to talk through. I wanted to ask you, aside from shirts, what are some of your favourite artefacts in the museum? Well, um, uh, the ball from 1966, which I... Uh, I um, seem to develop a very strange relationship with it. It's, I, I would say, anthropomorphized it. It's like it's a real thing. I still think of it that way because um, I, it's such an iconic object. You know, England still only win in a major tournament. Um, and in 2006, the Germans, uh, German Sports Museum in Cologne asked me to take it over. Uh, to Germany and as at the time it was owned by Virgin and Eurostar okay um, we got loads of publicity and I actually so it went on the train on Eurostar but it had its own seat <laughs> and the press came on to see the ball I was less important it's just the director there the ball with its seat um <laughs> I, I was asked to lie on the ground at Waterloo International and hold the ball over the O of Eurostar, oh, wow. you know, for a press photo. Not, not my face. There's another really <laughs> great picture of me holding it, but you can't see me. It's just the ball. It's ball, <laughs> man. We've got to Germany and it's the ball. The ball. The ball. From 66. Wow. It ended up going on German match of the day. I mean, it was just staggering. Um, wow the power that it has, um, that game for them. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that ball, um, it, and we sent it to Hong Kong for an exhibition and Japan. Yeah, it, it's travelled. It's better travel than I am. It's travel. Wow. OK. Now, look, having had your hands on that ball, Kevin, did it cross the line? Uh, yes, as I write in my book, <laughs> what you think you know about football is wrong, 50 myths of football. I, one of the earliest ones it is because um, there is no reason for any argument because there was um, there are two sets of movie uh, uh, cinema newsreel um, footage at the time. Television was very primitive, mm -hmm. um, so you can't judge from TV pictures. Um, the 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 kind of movie tone news that people watch uh, the, 
if they do bother with the cinema, doesn't give a good an angle. There's another one where they had there was a camera on the goal line, so it's quite uh, clearly over. And okay. we knew this in '66, and it's in colour. But of course, nobody went to the cinema anymore, hardly. Right. So we remember the grainy black and white TV on which you can see nothing. I mean, TV isn't very good now. You know, in cricket, when you the, you see a catch and then they say, this isn't going to be given because TV yeah. distorts. Uh, cinema does a lot, lot, lot less. But also the Germans just accepted when I said, well, the referee gave it. So it's a goal. You know, this, yeah. this, 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 this went into the German sense of fair play. I see. OK, well, there you go. There's your answer. See, there's your answer. Very nice. So, Kevin, what else is in that book then? You debunk a load of myths that you thought, you know, people would thought just like that, the ball never crossed the line. There's all sorts yeah, of we, stuff. There, so. We knew it at the time. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you one, one other um, that, it, you know, football short, because it's relevant, football short colours do matter. So, um, uh, um, academics who probably ought to have more... To, got too much time on their hands have studied sporting events and found you know i won't go into the detail but have found that wearing red in olympic events and others taekwondo etc if you wear red you win slightly more than the blue and if you change the colors you still get the same response if you you adjust the film uh and also statistically in football red te teams wearing red win more than they should and whether that's the bias of the referee or they attract more fans because they're wearing red, res is associated with success. Desmond Morris in the book, The Soccer Tribe, great book, um, 30 or 40 years posited this. So I looked at it and he's right. Um, academics have actually done the studies now to say there is a slight advantage in wearing a red shirt. Wow. What I, I haven't picked one of those. I haven't picked a red shirt because the three for me are the three really good great stories great stories right well look before we do get into those shirts kevin the question i ask everybody on the podcast is what do football shirts mean to you well it's the, it's the ultimate symbol of the game because i've been thinking about this what do you collect in a museum to represent the game well there's the ball yeah. there's the boot but ultimately what what identifies first of all the team that you played in um and and then what I identifies the individual once we got numbered shirts and then names on shirts and it's the shirt. So it is to me, it's the ultimate, I, a foot, a foot, you know, a boot's a boot. I know there's technology there. And to me, a ball's a ball, but the shirt is, is the, it's the player. And then it's the symbol of the player, like the Maradona shirt we're going to talk. It's the ultimate. It's what people remember. It's how you identify those players. Yeah. So look, let's talk about that first shirt then. So this is the Maradona, sorry, the Argentina 86 away shirt uh, worn by Maradona. It was uh, Lecoq Sportif as a manufacturer. Yes, and I understand it had to be put together really quickly because they didn't realise there was a clash and the other away kit wasn't going to work. So, yeah, I mean, so we were just thrilled to get this in the National Football Museum uh, from Steve Hodge, who, uh, from that great tradition of sweatshirt swapping, which we don't know when it actually began. Yeah. Um, I'd, uh, no, an academic has started to work on that. When is the first time people actually started swapping shirts? Because yeah. at the beginning of football, they wouldn't have done that because they've only got one piece of kit, so you're not going to swap it, are you? I'm sorry, I'm going to wear this for the rest of the season. <laughs> um, I'm being serious. You know, certainly until the 40s and 50s, you haven't got a spare kit. You're not going to swap that. You're lucky if you've got a clean one, you know, a clean one to wear after in the second half if you're covered in mud. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, Steve Hodge was very astute um, and to swap with Maradona uh, after that game. And uh, a lot of the other England players were not happy about it because obviously they think Maradona cheated in that game, of course, which, of course, he did with the hand of God goal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then he scored the brilliant goal. So Steve Hodge agreed to lend it to us to put it on display. And it immediately became the most popular item in the National Football Museum in Preston, where it was. And again, in Manchester, 
you, you'd think it would be the ball from the 66 or the perfect replica of the Jules Remy trophy that we have from 66. Mm. But no, it's Maradona's shirt. And I, 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 um, I found this out from the cleaners telling me it. Um, bizarrely. I said, well, what makes you realise that's the most popular item? I see a lot of people standing around and talking about this shirt. They said finger marks. That's the case where there are so many finger marks from people pointing at it or imagine they're going to touch it or making a comment. Finger marks on a showcase. Um, so the reaction was, it was really interesting. So, you know, Maradona, the Hand of God shirt, is really popular. Are people they're not spitting on it? No, no, no. <laughs> there is a, there's a. Oh, he cheated. The Hand of God. Uh, then it's God is small. Maradona was small. Is it shrunk in the wash? You know, he's so small, uh, yeah, yeah, which yeah, he is, yeah. which he was before he became less small as a player. He's tiny. That low center of gravity made him so. It was very small, Maradona. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the reaction is, yeah, but he did score that amazing goal, didn't he? And of course, whenever we display this, we have we have the two goals because uh, it is the yin and yang of football, isn't it? The the ultimate, the the you know the Argentinian poor kid from the streets who believes you should be able to cheat. The, the hand of God goal, which of course VAR would, <laughs> would, would, would thankfully the one what look nobody's going to argue that VAR isn't isn't good because it would have got rid of that. Yeah. Um, so, but then he scores the most sublime, brilliant goal, the goal of the century. So mm -hmm. um, people respected that genius. You know, we everybody coming to the museum realised that that he was a genius. You know that 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 goal is 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 stunning. Though he does actually just run in a straight line. Um, so uh, uh, Mervyn King, the governor of the Bank of England, explained this to me. He said, I once gave a speech about interest rates and linked it to Maradona's goal. I glazed over then. I didn't really understand what he was, what he was saying. But he said, Kevin, look, what you expect to happen is M Maradona to do that. Slalom, yeah. You, you weave, don't you? You, yeah. you do that. Um, you dribble. He says he dribbles, but he goes in a straight line. He oh. just goes for goal. He just goes through. And that's kind of the defenders are expecting him to weave, and he doesn't. You watch it. He just goes in a straight line and puts it in the back of the net. Interesting. I'll have to watch that again. You, you were kind enough to send me an academic paper you wrote about um, the, the kind of importance of football shirts and in particular with a focus on this shirt. And there's a, a piece or part of it that really triggered my mind I never thought about before. So in the 66 World Cup, England played Argentina and Argentina were, were pretty brutal, right? Argentina at that time during the 60s, there was like the famous, I think it's called the Battle of Montevideo, isn't it? Where Racing played Celtic in the Intercontinental Cup and it ended up in a horrible brawl. So Argentinian football had this like awful kind of reputation for brutality. And I think two of the players at the end of that game in 66 tried to swap shirts, right? And Alf Ramsey stepped out and said, uh, no, 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 you're not swapping shirts with him. They were animals. And apparently that was something that resonated in Argentina. I think like a really interesting point that you made in the article is that Maradona could have got his own back there by refusing to swap his shirt and calling England the animals. I just thought it was a nice point and very, something very Maradona. Surprised he never thought of that himself, you know? Yeah, he probably wasn't thinking back. Oh, all Argentinians are aware of that because... It, that's a little myth. That's in my book. Uh, it, England actually foul, committed far more fouls in that game than the Argentinians did. And not only that, it was grossly unfair how Ratin was sent off. He hadn't done anything. Right. You right. know, he was accused of violence of the tongue. Well, the referee didn't understand Spanish. I mean, <laughs> seriously, this caused a diplomatic incident across the world. Most people, the Italian press, the French press, the Argentinian press, of course, but across South America, the press went, this was not fair. And there were protests outside the English embassy in Uruguay, as well as in Argentina, right. and letters into the, the ambassadors saying, what happened to British fair play? We look up to you, the English, <laughs> in terms of fair play. And this was not fair. So, you know, there's, there's two ways of looking at, at, at that game. Why did Maradona swap? Because by then it was just, um, it was second nature, wasn't it? And of course, that means that somewhere, I mean, 
sadly no longer with Maradona, but the Maradona family have his prized possession, which is Steve Hodges' shirt. <laughs> so, sorry, no disrespect to Steve, but he's not in the same. He's not in the, he, he knows he's not in the same league as Maradona. So, um, yeah, he, he, you know, I, I think he, um, I think Steve Hodge just, just, you know, saw it as an opportunity. He was perhaps thinking ahead. I can't remember what he says. He says, you're really not sure what you're thinking. He yeah. got a lot of grief from the other team members for doing it afterwards, yeah. you know, dirty little cheat, you know, yeah, I'd yeah. wash my car with that, mate. But he, he just kept it as a souvenir. And then, of course, it's historical significance and no doubt it's financial significance. Yeah, of course. Of come since, because goal of the century. Yeah, no, it's, and it's fantastic that it's on, uh, on display in the museum too. So let's move on to your second shirt, Kevin. So this is the England home shirt that Bobby Moore swapped with Pele in, I think, the, was it the group stages of the 90s? Group stages, 1-0, yeah. yes. Yeah, well, well, several really interesting things. So um, England had had this specially designed shirt with the little holes in, you know, yep. um, uh, to keep them cooler. Don't know if it worked. There was high humidity and altitude. Um, and uh, because that was the in thing, because at that time, everybody in England suddenly discovered string vests. Even <laughs> I was forced to wear one as a child because apparently it kept you warmer. And it was something to do with astronauts and something. Who knows? Okay. It, but it's seriously, seriously, everybody wore a string vest because you still wore vests in those days. Yeah. Because yeah, um, yeah. your houses weren't very warm. Um, and, and so there was, there was this obsession with having little holes in things and that would keep you cooler or warmer or something. Yeah. So it, it was it was well designed. But the real significance is that there is that brilliant image uh, where Bobby Moore swaps with Pele and uh, it, it, it's extraordinary. It's become such a resonant and powerful image. Mm -hmm. uh, why? It's two friends, because they were friends already, and they go on to be even greater friends when they're together at New York Cosmos. It's yeah. two friends with a love of the game. Bobby Moore's had a fantastic game. Pele's had a fantastic game. They respect each other greatly. And it's greater resonance has become, you know, prepared to swap. And, you know, they weren't racist. Bobby Moore wasn't racist. But at the time, society was, the world was quite racist. Yeah, yeah. We still have problems there. There was no question, you know, Pele, but along with Muhammad Ali, was the greatest sportsman in, in the world. And yeah. he was yeah. revered in England. That, that Brazil 70 team, anybody who was around, and that includes me, age 10, still argues that that's the greatest football team of all time. Mm. Um, we might be, not be, who knows? You can't judge teams like that. Yeah. But if you were there, and I was lucky to be there as a 10-year-old, they are the greatest team of all time. Um, and Pelé is still the greatest. Um, and so uh, it, it's a wonderful moment about a black sportsman and a white sportsman swapping and, and you know, the friendship and warmth between them that comes from that. Yeah. Uh, in terms yeah. of the shirt, it, it has a really interesting story then because Pele had it. Don't know what happened to Pele's shirt. Mm. No, no, never turned up. Okay. Uh, so, but Bobby Moores um, ended up in a bar. So Pele, I don't think, built a collection. We know it ended up in a bar because it was in a frame. So when the private collector bought it at yeah. an auction, yeah. it came, it was in, it, it, it was in a frame and he agreed we display it at the National Football Museum and we take it out of the frame and conserve it. And it had a huge stain of nicotine oh, down here oh. and across there, like a giant L. A little bit on the other sides, but hugely here. I mean, really bad. Yeah. Years of being in a bar, in a frame. Don't do that. But it wasn't in a museum. Pelé, you know, hadn't put it in a museum. He put it in the bar. Um, so we got conservators from National Museums Liverpool are experts to to clean it up. I said, can you get rid of the, the, the nicotine stain altogether? They said, no, no, because the shirt would dissolve. And I'm sure the owner doesn't want it to end up as 
<laughs> you bits of rag on the floor. We can do our best, but the stain will remain, you know, and it is part of the history of the object, but yeah. it does slightly take away from it that there is this tobacco stained L, which yeah. is why yeah. when a player does something amazing, that shirt, as they walk off the pitch, even if they swapped it, should be handed over to the director of their National Football Museum to be put immediately away, because that means it doesn't gain in value and get sold at auction and it doesn't get maltreated. Exactly. I remember once, exactly. Talk, I remember once talking to Steve Coppola, I said, have you got a collection of your shirt? He said, I'm not into that. He said, I know lots of players are and they build up collections and stuff. So I used to let my son play in my shirts and then, you know, I'd put them in the wash and they'd in the wrong colour, you know, and they'd get turned pink and, you know, footballers don't have to respect their memorabilia. Of course they don't. Uh, but we, we as a nation should, um, particularly from key games. Come on. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, great shame. Brilliant game. England narrowly lost to Brazil, but we're clearly the second best team in the tournament. And uh, obviously, we're then unlucky to go out. Yeah, Germany, wasn't it, I think? Yes. Oh, don't remind me. I'm 10 <laughs> years old. We're 2-0 up. We, we won. Uh, Alf Ramsey takes my favourite player, Bobby Charlton, off to rest him for the next game. And somehow, somehow it's 3-2. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, so in the, in the imagery you sent me, you're picking your shirts and stuff, there's a picture of you standing next to Pele. You've met him next to the shirt. How was that experience? Yes. Yeah, well, I'd met Pele before. Um, I had lunch with him uh, um, through FIFA. Um, and... Uh, the bizarre when I met Pele, I mean, he was he's my ultimate idol. Bobby Charlton, who I met as president of the National War Museum, I got to know to her really well. But the first time I met him was extremely nervous. You're my childhood idol. I'm that <laughs> age, you see, a child of the in the 60s. So I was really nervous. Now, if I meet Sir Bobby, you know, it's some years since I have, and I, I know he has health problems now, it's like Kevin da 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 da, because he's quite shy as well. But right. the first time I met Pele, because I looked up to him so much metaphorically, when I met him, and he's my height, five foot ten, I said, you're only, I nearly said, but you should be taller. I look <laughs> up to you. You're only five foot ten. And no, that, that bizarre photo, which I sent you, of me in black tie with Pele, was we were invited to take the shirt out for an evening because Pele was going to be an event in Stoke-on-Trent wow. with, with Archbishop Besmond Desmond Tutu in a giant um, and some other celebrities for a charity event in Stoke. So if you're invited to do that, of course, you, you do it. And uh, I think Pele was uh, jet lagged and confused to be in a large marquee with a thousand people and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was a, gr a brilliant speaker, so funny, in a, mar a marquee, not a tent, in a marquee in Stoke-on-Trent. But there you go. Um, Lovely stuff. Very nice. And he was pleased the shirt looked so good because by then, of course, we've cleaned it and looked after it. Yeah, amazing piece of history. Fantastic. So we're going to go on to your third and your final shirt. So this is clearly, and I don't think we'll ever get an older shirt than this, but this is clearly the oldest shirt I've ever had on the podcast. This is the England home shirt worn in the first international versus Scotland from 1870. 1872. Oh, excuse me. 1872. Yep. 1872, because it's from the first international. Right. Um, there were unofficial internationals before then. Okay. Um, you know, but they, they decided they couldn't count, not least because these guys didn't know what they were inventing. Right. I mean, this is just right. a bit of fun to begin with, you know, but 1872, the year that the FA Cup um, and the first international, because the year before Scotland had come down to London, but they only had nine players. So oh. two English guys had to join the Scottish team. I mean, come on, it's like playground. Do you know what I mean? Oh, you've only got nine. We'll lend you some players. <laughs> um, so they decided, obviously, that, you know, the, the first international that could be recognised was when it was 11 against 11 from each country. Scotland, Glasgow, uh, the illustration I sent you. There is no photograph, but there's a beautiful illustration from the uh, Illustrated London News. Yeah. Um, and the bizarre outfits, uh, nil nil, sadly. Uh, I think it was a shilling to get in. It was yeah. quite respectable because this is pre 
uh, professional football. This is, you know, it's amateur. It's still rather middle class and upper middle class. The shirt of this uh, Arnold Kirk Smith. He's uh, he's from Ox. He's been at university in Oxford. Has his Oxford cap. You know, it isn't the it isn't the working men's game yet. Yeah. This is only nine years after the FA has been founded. Um, so I had to include this because I, the family had kept it. So that's what's so brilliant. Absolutely. Provenance. We know this is real because yeah. um, that's a big issue. You know, we know w you have to work out these things are real. You know, and we know Maradona's shirt's real. Um, you know, there's very, but we still question Steve Hodge about this. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and we had to make sure the 66 ball was real. And I, uh, I remember Victoria Derbyshire on the radio giving me a real grilling about that. I said, look, I could spend half an hour telling you about the different ways we've gone about provenancing it. But in a nutshell, Victoria, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how do you know when this is really good? How do you know when things are genuine, Kevin? So we know it's real. The family kept it. Um, so, yeah, not going to get older. So, um the reason the reason it came to us, it went up to auction before the National Football Museum had opened in Preston at 1999, and we didn't have the money. We were setting up the museum, so Harry Langton bought it. This collector of the fee collection, he said, "I'll pay whatever," and he bought it. And he said, "Look, you then buy it off me, get a grant somehow, because this is too important not to go in the National Football Museum, the oldest jersey from the first international." oldest England shirt, three lines of England on it. It's wool. It's a jersey. It's knitted. You know, um, it's quite extraordinary. It's not cotton, it's wool. Uh, it's the origins of football. It quite clearly matches the illustrations. Can you imagine what that was like when it was wet? Never oh. mind the balls getting heavy because it was wet. Imagine wearing a jersey. You know what it's like when you used to wear a jumper when you were a kid that was wool oh, when yeah. it was wet. It just ended up as this soggy... <laughs> <laughs> way down him, down by your knees, you know. So this was the must have happened to the, this Arnold Kirk Smith who, who wore it. Um, I think it was England captain on the day. Anyway, I think he only played about three internationals for England. But of course, that was pretty common then because they hardly ever played any internationals. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. they went on to more important things. You know, I, I'm probably going to go and row or, or play test cricket. Yeah. So it's not that important yet. It has an importance later, but. As a star object, I mean, yes, you're, you're extraordinarily light, unlike, and well, here we are, 20 years on, nothing older has, has come, been found. Exactly. No, it's a great choice. And it's the symbol of England, three lions. Yeah, it, it, the, the, it's there from the start, whether we can see it like that or, or not. It's sort of white. It's an off white. Yeah. It does kind of symbolise the English game. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, Kevin, there's some fantastic choices there. Thanks so much. I feel like I've learned lots already, but I feel like I need to get hold of your book to learn a little bit more. What's it called again? Please do uh, remind myself. Uh, <laughs> what you think you know about football is wrong. The Global Games Greatest Myths and Untruths, published by Bloomsbury. Delighted that John Motson and Guy Mowbray lo wrote lovely forwards for it. So, um, And it's a very sensible price, shall I say. Um, very nice. So a very sensible price. So, but be prepared for to be challenged on what you think is true. I didn't like finding out some of the things I found out in the book. You know, <laughs> we don't. We love myths. We don't want things that we believe to be true to be disproved. Well, actually, that didn't happen. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the story is better than the truth. <laughs> I will. I'll link all that stuff out in the uh, in the notes section, Kevin. But it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Anytime, great fun. Thank you. So there you have it. Massive thanks to Dr. Kevin for sharing his football kit memories with me. You can follow me, at my own collection on Instagram, or get in touch via Twitter or email. Make sure you follow Kevin too on social and also check out his book which is available on Amazon. The music you heard on the podcast was produced by Eva Led. You can check out his music on his Bandcamp page. There's links to absolutely everything I mentioned in the notes section. And finally, thanks to you for listening. If you have enjoyed it, please do spread the word. Give me a follow on social and subscribe to Football Kit Memories on your podcast player of choice. Other than that, I'll catch you next time.